Hello, and welcome back to another episode of, I don't know what we're calling this now, but we'll just keep going. So today we're talking about external and construct validity. Wahoo! So external validity overview. So we're gonna talk about what is external validity, why it's important, how do we do it, how does psychology stand in terms of external validity, and does it even matter? So what is external validity? So external validity is the extent to which findings from a study can be generalized to other situations and other people. And there are actually two types of it. One is population external validity, which uh, answers the question whether we can generalize these findings to the population, whatever population you're interested in generalizing to. And as well as, uh, and the other form of external validity is ecological external validity. So can we generalize these findings to other contexts? So an example of high population external validity is presidential polling. Those pollsters generally, not always, but generally do a good job of getting a random sample from the population, which is why generally, except for the last election, we can generalize the results from polling and make good predictions on who's going to win the presidential race. Uh, or a field study where you are out there in nature studying the thing as it happens that ha has high ecological validity. So the findings that you find in the field study generalize to the context you wish to generalize to as opposed to a uh, lab situation where um, as opposed to a lab where you have people administer hot sauce to other participants and that is your measure of aggression. Really? Hot sauce is aggression? That has pretty poor ecological external validity, if you ask me. All right, so why is it important? We want to know that our results have implications outside of the lab. If not, there's really no point in doing research. So there may be a situation where there is an interaction between our study characteristics and the findings of the study. For example, uh, you might find, or you might try to say that, hey, look, this uh, training program that I developed makes people smarter, or no, improves their performance on, you know, the class test or something. Well, maybe there's an interaction with intelligence and it happens to be that your sample is intelligent and for intelligent people, your training works. For people who aren't so well for people who aren't so intelligent, the training actually overwhelms them and hurts their performance. And that's what we're worried about with external validity is do these things uh, have interaction effects with the characteristics of the sample? And if they do, that's a problem for external validity. So how do we make it happen? How do we ensure that we have uh, good population validity? So for population external validity, the best way to ensure that we have it is by random sampling. Now, remember the difference between random sampling and random assignment. So random sampling mean, random assignment means you have your data, you have your people, you have your people, I'm talking too fast today. You have your people and you have a treatment and a control condition and you randomly assign them to one or the other. With random sampling, what you do is you define a well-defined population, maybe all voting age adults or all registered voters in the United States. And so that is your population and then you randomly sample from that which is really, really hard to do, by the way. So on average, if we do random sampling, it will be representative of the population. And the problem is, like I said, that's extremely hard to do. So in those situations, we do what's called purposive sampling. So we specifically choose people that reflect population characteristics. Um, so an example of purposive sampling is stratified random sampling where you know that all right the demographics of the united states are x percentage uh, caucasians x percentage uh, native americans x percentage african americans etc etc and then you purposively select african americans and asians and native americans and those sorts of things such that the proportion of people in your sample 
is approximately equal to the proportion of people in the United States. Uh, problem is, uh, you have to decide what characteristics to purposively sample on. Is it ethnicity? Is it age? Is it intelligence? Is it socioeconomic status? And the problem is, uh, you have to guess, and you may be wrong. So if you have had a chance to watch my missing data video, you know that you must control for the cause of missing this for your estimates to come out right. Well, you can think of non-random sampling as a missing data situation. So you have missing data. You have people who are not in that study we talked about before. You have people who are not as intelligent in your study. That is creating a bias in your parameter estimates. So what do you do? You purposively sample, but now you have to know exactly what makes your sample different from a random sample, and that's kind of hard to do. As far as ecological validity, how do we maximize ecological validity? Well, what we do is we mimic the real world as much as possible. Um, so for example, uh, there is an app that monitors trips to the bar, and that is their measure of alcohol consumption. Well, that has high ecological validity because people usually carry their phones anyway, and people usually go to the bar anyway, at least if they're that kind of people. So in that situation, it has high ecological validity. Um, a example of bad ecological validity is if you were to ask participants what they would do if they were to encounter a particular situation. That's just bad, okay? People generally don't answer truthfully or they think they're answering truthfully when in actuality, if they were in that situation, they would respond a little differently. And that sort of situation has very, very poor ecological validity. So where does psychology stand? Well, um, you probably could have guessed that the vast majority of samples come from undergraduate psychology students. There was an article written a couple years ago saying that psychology is weird, which stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And yet in psychology, we try to say that we are finding laws of human behavior, not just Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic behavior. We want to say that these apply to everyone. Well, it turns out that ain't the case. So do our findings generalize across culture? Generally, no. So does it even matter though? There's an article back in the 1990s, 1980s, I think, uh, MOOC, wrote an article that says, that basically suggested that it doesn't really matter. This fact that we are not representing the population doesn't matter. And Mook's argument was sometimes what matters is that it happened, not every circumstance under which it could happen. So this is uh, kind of a Popperian perspective. So remember Popper as the philosopher who believed in falsification and so Mook is kind of making a popper argument saying that the lab is a good place to falsify things. And if we fail to falsify it in the lab, we have show demonstrated that it can happen. Well, here's my response to that. If theories are discovered and they're tested and they're refined in the lab, have we really gained anything? No, I don't think so. And to suggest that those theories that are discovered, tested, refined, retested, etc., in the lab have validity to everyone. That's very, very, what's the word I'm looking for? Optimistic and overly optimistic in my opinion. And in light of the recent replication crisis, which some might think that may be an issue of generalizability, which there's some arguments for that. But um, I would say that this is a much bigger problem than we've been willing to admit for the last hundred years. So that brings us to random assignment. So random assignment equates treatment and control groups on average. That's what we talked about last time. Um, and so by so doing, it makes confounding explanations implausible and it yields unbiased estimates of the treatment effect on average. Okay. There's a whole lot of research that says that. And so you might be reading this and saying, all right, random assignment equates treatment and control groups, removes confounding explanations, and yields unbiased estimates of the treatment effect. So it seems logical that random assignment should fix the convenience sampling estimates. Am I right? Well, actually, no. 
And why is that? Because our estimate of the standard error is shot, okay? So yes, it is true, it will yield unbiased estimates of the treatment difference, but our estimate of the standard error is off, and since in statistics, just about everything we do relies on standard errors, we in trouble here, folks. So here's a quick simulation that I did. What I did was I simulated 100 IQ scores um, that correlated with training and performance. Then what I did was I added a randomly assigned treatment effect. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead on that bullet point. So I created a randomly assigned treatment effect in the computer, and then I compared the top 50% uh, to a randomly chosen. So basically I selected those who were top 50% of IQ and compared the training effect on performance versus a random sample of the same size, and then I did this like 10,000 times. And here is a dis the distributions of the random samples on the left versus the convenient samples on the right. The shaded box represents the scores of the treatment group. The non-shaded scores represent the, tr the difference or the distribution of the control group. And so if you were look to look at the you know, middle lines in the left plot, so the right side relative to the left side on the left plot, the size of that difference is approximately the size of the difference on the right side. But remember, when you're computing a Cohen's D or an F ratio or anything like that, you divide the difference by some estimate of the variability. Now look at the size of the plots in the left. They are massive. The range is massive. Now look at the size on the right. It is much smaller, about between a half and a two-thirds smaller range on the right side relative to the left side. And so if you are dividing, so if you've got two, if you've got a number, let's say the difference is, in this situation, looks like it's about 10. So you've got a difference of 10 for the random group versus the convenient sample. So those numbers are the same, 10 and 10, but you're dividing by a bigger number over on the left relative to a smaller number on the right. If you divide by a smaller number, what does it do? It increases the size of that estimate. So this illustrates that in convenient sampling, what we are doing is we are inflating our estimates relative to a random sample. I'll think about that for a minute. The estimates we find in the literature are inflated relative to a random sample. Is anyone concerned? I'm concerned. Why? Because if you look at the literature, the estimates that we find in the literature are tiny, and they're found with convenient samples. So if they are tiny on convenient samples, what happens in a random population? Those tiny estimates are going to be even smaller. Yikes. So in summary, yes, treatment effects or mean differences will be unbiased. Yes, but the standard errors will, be not, will not be. So significance test statistics will be biased, as will effect size estimates. So in this situation, they will always be positively biased. By the way, that was my dissertation, y'all. And uh, if you're interested, I can give you the paper for a proof of this. It just basically shows mathematically what I just explained to you. So in other words, in psychology, we may be con committing a whole lot of type 1 errors. Oops. But things can actually get much worse than this. So let's say there is actually an interaction between the selection variable or the one variable that makes our sample differ from a random sample, and the treatment effect. So again, the treatment effect and the selection variable are interacting. What happens then? So here's a graphical depiction of what's happening. So again, we only have access to the selected sample. And we don't know why the selected sample is differ from the unselect differs from the unselected sample. And so that's why in the x-axis you have a big question mark. We don't know what characteristic that is that makes our sample differ from a random sample. And on the y-axis, we have cl classroom performance, solid line is treatment, dot, dash line is the control group. And that's all we observe. And so we might say, wow, the treatment works. Look at that. It made people better. But if we were to somehow measure that variable on the x-axis and, and figure out what those lines were into the unselected area, those lines may actually cross, in which case, what we find in a selected sample may not reflect what happens in the entire population. Again, this is an example of an interaction effect going on. 
So with an interaction effect, even treatment effects will be biased, or what Applebaum and Kramer call the marginal effects. And in this situation, the main effects don't even make sense because they depend on that variable, that third variable. So F statistic or the T statistic or the D statistic statistic may be overestimated or underestimated and without the bottom tail, without knowing how the rest of the population performs, we have no way of knowing. And the same holds for the effect sizes. So in summary, does convenient sampling matter? Yes, absolutely. Um, at least in situations where the selection variable and the dependent variable are correlated. When no interactions exist, effect sizes will be overestimated. When an interaction exists, effect sizes may be overestimated or underestimated. And by the way, that is only the case with one selection variable. If you have more than one selection variable, it gets even more complicated than that. So, solutions. There are statistical corrections, and that's what I did with my dissertation. Some subsequent work was I developed some, some uh, corrections that kind of sort of work. Um, but I think a better thing to do is to do purposive sampling. So we tend to do s research on undergraduate psychology students um, because it's convenient and it's cost efficient, but maybe we can start doing a little more MTurk studies and get larger swaths of the population. So let's say you suspect IQ may be an interactive term or it may be a variable that interaction, interacts with your treatment effect. And so what do you do? You purposively sample those of a lower IQ to participate in your study. Okay, let me just pause for just a minute and remind you of the take home message of this entire course. Remember uh, last week and or the week before, uh, I said that if you take nothing else home from this cor course, take this one thing home. That we need converging evidence across multiple studies. So I recognize that asking people to do a random sample with a, an effect they're trying to find is maybe wasted effort because we may not even find it. So in that situation, I'm totally okay with doing a convenient sample. But you had better replicate that. And you had better replicate that on a much larger sample that is much more representative of the population that you find. Let's say you replicate it there. Well, now you spend the next five or six studies intentionally finding situations where you suspect there may be an interaction effect there. Okay, it might not hurt with less intelligent people, go sample less intelligent people. It might not help with people who are of a different socioeconomic status, so go sample those people. Different ethnicities, go sample those peoples. And then what you do is you develop accumulating evidence across multiple studies, each of which ad addresses a different weakness, and by the end, after multiple, multiple studies, hopefully you have converging evidence that's saying, hey, I found something here. That's how research ought to be. Now remember, external and internal validity are always in a tug of war. So if you were to maximize one, almost of necessity, you will sacrifice the other. And just as I just said, that is why it is, in, it is so important to have what kind of evidence across what studies? We have converging evidence across multiple studies. So let's go ahead and review. So internal validity. We are asking, are the causal explanations in our study legit? With statistical conclusions validity. We want to say, are the statistical conclusion, the statistical inferences we make legitimate? For example, rejecting the null versus failing to reject the null. With external validity. Can we generalize these conclusions across settings, which is ecological validity, as well as people, which is population validity, population external validity. And now we get into the final form of validity, which is construct validity. So with construct validity, well, think about what is a construct. A construct is a psychological, well, it doesn't even have to be psychological, but it's in psychology, it's a psychological att attribute that we want to tap into. For example, intelligence or love or extroversion, those sorts of things. And I believe this is your book I'm quoting. I forgot to write. Who said that? Let's pretend it's your book. So disagreement is likely to arise about the definition of the constructs to be assessed. This occurs in part because there are no natural units of measurement. 
So how do you measure height? Well, it makes sense. You use a measuring stick. How do you measure IQ? How do you measure love? What are the metrics of interest? Well, that's one of the weaknesses of psychology is we don't know how to measure these things. Or at least there's no universe, universally agreed upon way to measure these things. So uh, construct validity is concerned with understanding these constructs as well as measuring them. So why are they important? Well, constructs are the central way we connect theory to experiments. So if the measures of the constructs are flawed, the theory is going to be flawed as well. Two, they're important because constructs, construct labels carry important political, social, and economic consequences. And by the way, this is Messick's point. Uh, number three, creating and defending constructs is a fundamental task of science. That is exactly what science is all about. So, as we have done with other forms of validity, let's talk about the threats to validity. One is construct irrelevance. So, we measure something that is irrelevant to the construct. So, an example of this might be, let's see, you're, you have um, a statistics exam, and in that statistics exam, you ask people how they feel about... Brad Pitt. Okay? Your feelings about Brad Pitt have absolutely nothing to do with your statistics knowledge. That would be an example of construct irrelevance. Another one is ex inadequate explication of construct constructs. That means you didn't describe the construct very well. Um, which leads into a related problem, which is underrepresentativeness of constructs. So if I'm administering a statistics exam and I ask you 100 questions about regression, but don't ask you a single thing about means or variances or t-tests or ANOVA or anything like that, I have underrepresented the construct of statistical knowledge, at least univariate statistical knowledge or something like that. Um, another threat is monomethod bias. So mono method means you have one method of assessing the construct, and in which case the method becomes part of the construct. So if you're using paper and pencil exams, that is one method to assess statistical understanding. And what tends to happen is some people are just good pencil, pen and pencil test takers, or pen and paper, or pencil and paper, whatever. They're just good test takers. And so their scores, which should reflect their statistical understanding, they get a little edge, they get a little bump in their statistical construct score because they're just good at taking tests. Well, that difference isn't due to statistical knowledge, it's due to some unrelated construct. So that's a mono method bias, which also is a method or is a form of construct irrelevance. So how do we ensure construct validity? SMEs, that's one way to do it. SMEs are subject matter experts. So you get a lot of people together who know a, a lot about the construct and you ask their opinions about your measure of that construct and ask whether you have adequate, adequately tapped into the construct and whether you're measuring certain things that aren't related to it. Another way is that we assess reliability and we assess validity, which I believe we're going to talk about quite a bit more later in the semester. If not, you will have the marvelous opportunity to talk about this in the measurement class. So that gets us to Messick and Messick is really, um, he, Messick was, I don't, I don't believe he's alive anymore, but Messick was a deep, deep thinker um, who really revolutionized the way we think about validity. And so here are some of his arguments. He said validity is not a binary thing. You don't have it. It's not one of those things where you have it or you don't. So it's, um, it's on a scale. You have more or less of it. And all forms of validity are related. So internal, external, construct, ecological, consequential, all these things are related. And to quote Messick, he said, score validation is an important empirical evaluation of the meaning and consequences of measurement. And so he identified various ways to categorize construct validity. He talked about content relevance and representativeness. He talked about substantive validity. 
So in this situation, uh, let's say you're measuring intelligence. Uh, if you are measuring intelligence, people should be using their intelligence to measure or to take the exam that you're administering. Likewise, if I am measuring statistical knowledge, people should be accessing their statistical knowledge when answering my exam. Structural validity, so does the measure have the same structure that theory dictates? And is it scored in the similar way? And this would make more sense if you guys had some factor analysis. Basically, uh, if you have a factor structure, if, if the theory says that it should have a certain factor structure, then your exam should have the, or your measure of that construct should have the same factor structure. Uh, generalizability. So is your sample of the construct domain generalizable to other settings, items, tests, etc.? So you have one measure. Does it generalize to other measures of um, validity or other measures of that same construct? Uh, convergent and discriminant validity. Does your measure correlate with other measures that it should correlate with? like love may, at least romantic love, should measure or should correlate with measures of attraction. And likewise, it shouldn't correlate with measures that it shouldn't be, that theoretically shouldn't be correlated with it. So your love of someone should be uncorrelated with, uh, let's see, your shoe size, for example. Okay, so do those things naturally remain uncorrelated? And finally, consequential validity. So does the use of your test have the intended consequences, whether positive or negative? So remember, when we measure constructs, sometimes the labels that we attach to these constructs have consequences. If you have a measure of um, guilt, for example, a DNA test, and somebody goes to jail because of your DNA test, is that an intended consequence? If it's not, then maybe it doesn't have good construct validity. If it does, now remember, uh, consequences can be bad, and yet they still have good consequential validity. So across all of these, hopefully we have converging evidence that what we're really measuring is what we hope and think we're measuring. So here are some validity scenarios. I invite you to pause and consider these scenarios and identify what form of validity is being threatened and how you can address, address these scenarios. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for joining us as we talk about two very important forms of validity. See you next time.